had. So if you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 6, and what was happening with this particular passage here is there seemed to be some question, and it seemed to be arising from John the Baptist and some of his followers, and the question was, who is Jesus Christ? And specifically, the question came, and it was, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? They were asking Jesus for almost some type of confirmation that he is really the one whom God has sent. And that question is still being asked today, just as much as it was then. People are searching for a savior today, even some of them unconsciously, but they are looking for a savior. And some of them take a look at Christ the Lord and take a look at the message of the Bible and they ask themselves, is this real or not? Is this something I can trust in? Well, let's read the first six verses of Matthew chapter 11. When Jesus had finished giving orders to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to teach and preach in their towns. When John, and this is John the Baptist, in prison, heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent a message to his disciples, or by his disciples. They asked him, are you the one who is come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. Now he begins to list some of the happenings. The blind see, the lame walk, those with skin diseases are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. Or let's say the gospel is preached to the poor. And if anyone is not offended because of me, he is blessed. Today I'd like to focus on how Jesus listed as one of the ways to show that he is the Messiah. And that is that the gospel was shed with the poor of the earth specifically. He mentions here, the poor are told the good news. People don't seek God in the same ways all the time. Sometimes it seems like some have preconceived ideas about who they want God to be. They have an idea of what the Savior should do for them. And sometimes people misunderstand what a Savior should be. The Jews were seeking a certain type of Savior at that time, and we know they got it all, all wrong. They did not expect the kind of Savior that Jesus was. They expected a majestic person to come and to take over the country and the nation to establish an earthly kingdom right at that time a preconceived idea and when Jesus didn't meet their notions they had then they rejected this must not be the savior and so today people have ideas of what Christ should do for them and many times it's misguided it's time things that people want sometimes materially based and they come to Christ and they, they say more like, give me this and this and this. And this, many of these things are temporary type blessings. In John's day, they were looking for a Messiah. Jesus gave them a reply. Most of these things we could understand and quickly relate to. The healing, the blind seeing, the lame walking, deaf being able to hear, diseases healed. Even the dead raised were all demonstrated through Jesus Christ. And yet he lists even one more thing as being such a priority. The poor are told the good news. 
The poor are preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. The sign of the gospel is that it is shared with the poor of the earth, with all people unreservingly. We must, as a church, share the absolute, true, uncompromised gospel of Christ. There is one way to salvation to the Father. That is Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Now today, people are proposing all kinds of different things to get to Christ. People are tending to have what they would call an open mind. And they are wrapping their arms around some other way or system. But the Bible says clearly there is no other name under heaven by which a person might be saved. Now that's exclusive of everything else. And I really believe in my heart that that issue is going to be one of the greatest issues in the coming times ahead. Some of the issues we raise up, and they are uh, big issues, issues of sinfulness in the church and compromise and all these things we talk about and want not to be a part of in our churches or in our lives. But perhaps one of the greatest ways will be the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as Savior. This is going to be judged very harshly by the world. They're going to call us closed-minded and selfish and bigots and all kinds of names that go with uh, the true gospel sometimes being preached. But we must share that Jesus alone is Savior. So when we go to Guatemala or when we go up the road a mile or when we go across the county or wherever we go to share the gospel, there's no question about what we're going to share. We don't have to conform our message to a certain type of culture. You know, it was so unique to me to be standing in a whole different culture, whole different experiences that most people's lives in Guatemala entail. And yet, to be able to preach the simple gospel message there that is just as real and important as it is here. And to see them, by the Holy Spirit, speaking their hearts, grasp out at that very message. We didn't have to study the culture and change what we said. No, we are not content to preach any compromising gospel, but we are absolutely confident when we preach faith in Jesus Christ alone that that is going to change the hearts. And so the purity of the message must always be maintained. We must always check ourselves. If a preacher, author, teacher, scholar hint at any other way, they must be singled out and banished and put away from the church. We don't want to hear a single hint of some type of co compromise. Our pure gospel message must be shared no matter what. When we went to Guatemala, we didn't hide the gospel. We didn't hide it behind our gifts. We didn't try to glorify, look at the great gifts we brought to you in the food. Look at all the work we did in this food. No, we kind of acknowledged that the food that we gave would only last a short period of time. And I was thinking this morning when I got up, some people might be eating some of the food we shared today. But I doubt they'll be eating in a month from now. We didn't give them the end all for worldly hunger. We gave them gifts to show our love. And we pray that they could see Christ as we brought those basically humble gifts. But thank the Lord that we could had the means to do what we did. But in every greeting that we gave, and I'm thankful that just about most of the group were involved in giving some type of group of greeting. In every greeting we gave, we emphasized that it was the Bible that we were giving them and the message of Christ that was eternal. The food was temporary. It was a blessing. But it's temporary and the Bible is the eternal truth that goes beyond our worldly hunger here today. And so I was certainly praying that as everyone received a Bible, 
they wouldn't just look at it as a book and take it home and lay it somewhere, but that they would indeed open those pages and read it. We didn't go down and preach politics. We didn't preach social issues. We didn't even preach environmental type stuff. We preached the Word of God. All those other things might have their place, but not in the presence of preaching the gospel message to people. Food is temporary. The Bible is for eternal life, and Jesus is our eternal Savior. And what else can be raised up in light of these kinds of things to preach or to teach? And the same way with our church here at home. What else should we preach except Jesus Christ being the Savior? Some seem like they want to save the material world. We want to save the souls of people of the world. Our preaching must be in a form that they can understand. The poor are told the good news. What kind of teaching and preaching do they need? They don't need preaching or teaching that impress them. I certainly didn't try to impress them with my knowledge of Scripture. I only wanted to share the simple gospel message. Almost the type of message that we would teach our young children. And this doesn't mean to dismiss that, that these people are very knowledgeable and bright. They can understand. But the preaching needs to take a form that they can understand. We don't come to seek attention to ourselves. The last thing we wanted to say to them or, or would, would want to say to anyone was look at who we are. Look at what Christ has done for us, except just in a pure testimony form. But we didn't come to bring attention to, to ourselves. I didn't want to show my education, such as little as it is anyway. I didn't come to impress them with my knowledge. But may the Bible and the Holy Spirit be my guide as I preach the gospel. Many of us got up for just a few minutes with unprepared remarks. It wasn't that we had the chance to really uh, go and put together a sermon. But we just rose at that occasion. And we relied upon the Holy Spirit. We couldn't speak the language. Oh, that's a barrier. I want to go home and study Spanish this afternoon. And so this evening I'll be able to speak it. Wouldn't that be nice? I couldn't speak the language and I was relying on an interpreter and what amazed me, I would say about a half a dozen words and it'd take him 20 minutes to get out what I said. And you know, I'm standing here. What's he telling them? All I said was hi. It took him 20 minutes to explain. And that's the barrier that we had. I, I couldn't speak the language, but you know what I could speak? The gospel truth. It doesn't take an interpreter very long to interpret that. And we had very good interpreters. Adam was so good. And, and afterwards, uh, one, one incident I had, I shared, that the Bible was God's love letter to us. And Adam went, uh-huh. He went like that. And then he talked for like 10 or 15 minutes. And later on I asked, I said, Adam, I was amazed that you talked so long about God's love letter to us. And here he went on about how they like to receive letters from their husbands or their wives at some point, love letters. And he went on to explain that a little bit to bring out just a simple word I said about God's word being a love letter to us. So you see, he knew how to not just translate the words, but translate the ideas. And so he was just very vital in what we were trying to do in translating. Our gospel message will change lives. We can be confident of that. We don't have to come home, you know, Grover and Matt, and the rest that went, we don't have to come home and wonder, well, will this make any difference in their lives? Because yes, it will. 
the word of God will not return void. And if I would choose to live in Guatemala, you know what would happen? I'd become a Guatemalan. I don't know if I'd said right or not. But I would turn into a Guatemalan and I would probably drive like crazy in a little while. And I would be like them. You know what? When we become Christians, what happens? We become a Christian. We live among Christians. We become like them. I will be like a Christian if I associate and live among Christians. And so I'm coming back to West Virginia and I'm a West Virginian. And I sort of take that with me wherever I go. You know, um, Adam is from Alabama. And I didn't realize that Alabamans talk so much differently than we do. I mean, he's from Alabama, and you can tell it. Our preaching, teaching can and does save lives. And so while when we went to Guatemala and come home, we don't have to wonder whether we revolutionized the whole country. Because we did not do that. But you know how to change the leadership of a country or a nation or a community, you start by preaching to the, even the poorest people. They receive the gospel. And then the effects and the snowball effects. And after a while, you know what happens? You really do transform a certain area or community or even a country. I had never been to Guatemala before. I've been to Haiti. And even after five trips to Haiti and trying to understand the culture and the dilemma that is in Haiti. That's all I can say. I heard they had an earthquake in Haiti this past week. I'm not sure how severe it was. But when I was in Guatemala, I saw challenges, yes. But I also saw potential improvement potential real change and improvement in the gospel message preached to the people in Guatemala. I look forward to going back again sometime. Not sure if I'll be able to go this February, but maybe. Hoping to. I have enough Guatemalan money that I have to go back there and spend it. I can't uh, spend it here. I asked Grover what to do with it. He said, well, just keep it and take it back with you. <laughs> so he must be thinking I'm going back again, which I think we will. Maybe Christy will go. Maybe you will go. Now, everybody don't have to go to Guatemala to preach gospel. We can do that and should do that right here. And you don't have to be a preacher to preach the gospel either. All you need to be is an example of Christian living and love among your neighbors and friends. And they will see it. They will see what's different in you. I could tell you more trucking stories. Sometime I will. I'll tell you how I didn't even many times speak a word. But I tried to show something. And I could also show, tell you how they saw it. Almost in amazement to me. They saw You know what they saw that was so effectively? They saw a difference. It might be hard to put your finger on it, but in one particular occasion when everybody was getting all upset and getting angry about having to wait in a long line, I was just kind of standing there. It wasn't any use to get angry about it. It was going to take as long as it was going to take, and so I just had to take it. You know, he just stood there. And you know what? When I got up to the counter, the man actually asked me what was wrong with me. It's like, why aren't you acting the way the rest... I didn't even think about it so much until he said, he said, you're not acting the way the rest of them are. And I think I told him something like, I'm a preacher. And he said back to me, I can see that. And I said, brother, you just gave me one of the greatest compliments I ever got. If you say you can see that in me, even above what I might say, you can see that. Brothers and sisters, you live the Christian life among your friends and neighbors. They will be able to see that in you. You won't have to preach them. But you know, the Spirit will give you the right words at the right time. He'll know just what you should say. And He'll let you know. And let me know. Praise the Lord.
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, when you answered John Baptist about who you were, one of the things you said is that the gospel message is preached among the poor. To me, this prioritizes and emphasizes what we should be doing. It doesn't mean that we're standing on the street corner and preaching, but it does mean that we are living out and sharing the gospel wherever we are. Whether we are on the street or road that we live on, or whether we're across the county or in the community, or even in another country, we can preach the simple gospel message and we can trust that with the help of the Holy Spirit, this message will intercede into their lives and will speak to their very hearts and they will be moved and changed to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. So I thank you not only for the events of this past week that we had, but also for the events that's happening in all of our lives not just on the mission trip, but in all of our lives that we live, each of us, every day. You're doing more in us and through us than we recognize. Let us just come to know that we want to share the gospel with every single person, no matter who they are, everyone. I pray that we can do just that. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.